John 14, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 here this morning. Now, this particular passage of Scripture follows some very dramatic information that Jesus gave to his disciples. And it must have rocked their world. Jesus could see it on their faces. And he had just told them that he was going to be betrayed by one that was sitting there at the table. This must have just shocked them. Judas has just gone out and left them. And he has gone to actually bring those that are going to arrest Jesus. And then he told them that he was going to go away. And they couldn't follow him right then. This must have just put fear into their heart. I mean, can you imagine? You've got thousands of people following Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm leaving and I'm going to leave all these people for you. You thought you think to yourself, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And then he goes on to tell them that in their hearing, that Peter specifically is going to betray Jesus. Again, tremendous shock. But he goes even further than that. He tells them that every single one of them is going to stumble that very night because of him. This is not found in our text, but found in Matthew 26, 31. There Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So Jesus tells them this and he must be able to see on their faces their total dismay, their total shock, their fear, their anxiety in their hearts. And this is why he says what he says in this text. Let's just read it. Verse 1 of chapter 14. He says, let, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus says these words to them at a moment that was of great need. They had troubled hearts. He knew that. And so he speaks these words. Now, the ideas and the truths that we're going to share with you this morning here in verses 1 through 3 are just the, the greatest issues that he wanted to start with to try and calm their troubled heart. But in reality, all of what you have in chapter 14, 15, and 16 are all spoken to that end. So I want you to see these three chapters as really how the Lord is trying to calm their troubled heart. And he will go on to say to them that they need to be men and women of prayer. They need to be men that are crying out to God in prayer. They need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That he's going to send the Holy Spirit to fill them. And then he tells them, I'm going to come and I'm going to live inside of you. I'm going to live inside of you. You are going to be in me and I in you. So he, he makes this very clear to them just in this 14th chapter. But the issues that he addresses here to begin with are really the most important issues. And this is where we need to begin this morning. Now every one of us in this room gets a troubled heart at some time. And how do you deal with that troubled heart? What do you do? How does the Lord want to minister to you in that time when you are troubled? Well, the counsel that he gives here is powerful. It's essential. Because, I mean, if you just listen to the evening news, it should trouble your heart. 
as to the, the moral decay of our country. If you, if you look into your own life and see the struggles that you go through personally, this should trouble your heart at times. Or maybe you're having a troubled time with a, your son or daughter. You're, you're struggling in your parenting or you're struggling in your marriage or whatever the case may be. There's a whole lot in this world to cause me to have a troubled heart. And so this is what Jesus says about how to deal with a troubled heart. He says very, three things very clear here. First, he commands them. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Now, when you read that, you think to yourself, well, that's easy to say. Anybody can say that. It's another thing if you're living it, if you're walking in it. You see, have you ever had anybody tell you that? You're just totally distraught. And someone says, now calm down. Now take it easy. Now, you know, just, just trust the Lord. And you're thinking, yeah, that's so easy to say. But it is the truth. It is the reality. It is what you need to do. You need to let not your heart be troubled. Now, the important thing in this little phrase here is that it's a command. This is in the imperative mood in the Greek, which means it's a command. He's commanding them, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't go there. Don't go down that road in your head. Now, if Jesus commands them to do something, will he not give them the power to do it? That's the only question you need to start with in your mind. If he commands them to do it, they are able to do it. And God will give them the grace to do it. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and he said, with men this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. If God can create the heavens and the universe, if he can create you and me, if he can take care of everything that's going on in this, in this world and in this universe, then he can take care of this one small thing. He can help you to control your thoughts and your, your heart. This is what God commands. So, did you know that you have a responsibility, a right, to control where your heart goes, what your mind thinks? Did you, do you understand that? Do you understand that that is your responsibility according to Scripture? Probably the best known passage that I could quote to you this morning is in Proverbs 4.23. It says, keep your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. So you're to keep your heart. That's your responsibility. Because where your heart goes, so goes your life. So goes your walk. So goes your relationships. Not only with God, but also with people. So you have the responsibility and the right to control where your heart goes. So when Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, he's saying, don't go there. So this is your choice, your responsibility. Now the word heart and mind are really synonymous terms. You will see Jesus throughout the Gospels, he will use these words interchangeably in the Scripture. And so when he commands them, he asks them, why do you think this? Why are you thinking that? He's saying, why is your heart in this place? Or sometimes he asks the question, why is your heart so troubled? In, other, in another scripture, he's saying, why are you troubled in your mind? So you'll see this, these words used synonymously. And so... Controlling your thoughts will control your feelings. Now, this is something that I deal with in my book, Winning Your Personal Battles. I wrote an entire chapter on this subject because this issue is 
critical. Controlling what goes on in your mind will determine how you feel and how you live. And it is an essential thing. Here is one of the exhortations that is so clear. Jesus makes it absolutely clear. Saying, don't go here. Don't let your heart be troubled. Now, you may think to yourself, well, okay, Steve, do you have a heart that's never troubled? Absolutely not. Uh, my heart gets troubled all the time. And it, is, it happens to everyone in this room. Everybody gets a troubled heart. Now, some of us deal with that troubled heart or troubled mind very quickly. Others of us don't. And it goes on sometimes for, for days or at least an entire day until you come to a place where you just say, you know what, this is so fruitless. This is ridiculous. I can't go here. You know, and you just lay it down. And you trust one of the promises of God because when you're troubled, most people go to the Scripture. They open up the Bible. They start to read. And there the Lord will direct your eyes to one of His promises. And those promises will lift you. And you'll say, okay, I'm just going to trust your Word. And you let it go. But there are some times that you just, you get hurt by someone very deeply. Or maybe you hurt someone very deeply. And you go to bed at night and you start thinking about that issue and you replay the video in your mind over and over again. You replay the audio and what they said and what you said. and You've been there, haven't you? Everybody's been there. And you say to yourself, I, I just can't stop thinking about this. What is my problem? What, why, how can I get out of this? And it's like 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock and you're looking at the, at the clock and you just say to yourself, man, what am I going to do? And again, you come to a place where you just say, you know what, I can't do anything about this tonight. I, Lord, I commit this to you and you finally fall asleep. Then you wake up in the morning and you start through the whole thing all over again, right? You start doing it again. I've been there. I've done that. And so I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a battle in your, in your mind. And so you have to know, how do I control this at that moment? Now, some of it, sometimes you get to, into one of those circumstances and you see you're going down that path. You see, you, you can recognize, man, I'm, I'm following this little rabbit trail down to bitterness. I'm following this trail down to jealousy. I'm following this other trail, you know, down to self-condemnation. You just, you see yourself starting down the road and you start to get all of the anxiety inside. And sometimes you just say, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm, I'm not going to go there. Lord, I commit it right now. And you're out of it. Why? It's because you've made a choice to obey the command, which is to what? Keep your heart. Offer your heart. Don't let your heart and your mind go there. You refuse to go there. This is what the scripture teaches. Let me show you a couple of passages. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. There Paul said, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Now, the word forgetting there is an interesting Greek word. It means to literally put out of your mind. Put the past out of your mind. Just say, I refuse to go there. I, and this is, is especially true for self-condemnation. When you're beating yourself up, saying, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. I wish I had never said that to that person. Now look what I've done. You know, you've been there. And he, this condemnation is just, it's just like a knife in your heart. And you have to say, 
No, I'm not going there. God, you have forgiven me because I've asked you to forgive me. What did you just do? You trusted a promise of God. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. So you trusted God's promise and you've let it go. You're not going to let your heart go to that place. Paul goes on to say in Philippians 4, 6 through 8, this just a few verses on from where we just read. He said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or ability to figure it out, will guard your hearts and minds. Notice both word, it, words are used there. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So he's telling them, you need to pray. Prayer is an essential thing. In John 14 here, in just a few verses, that's where Jesus goes. He says, you need to pray, guys. You need to be in prayer. If you're going to keep your heart from being troubled, you need to pray. And then he goes on here in Philippians 4, 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now the word meditate here is in the present tense. He's saying you need to be continually meditating on these things. You need to be continually thinking about these things. The word meditate literally means to just take into account these truths. So you need to think, choose to think about these things and not what, where you have failed or whatever the problem might be. And so it's an essential thing. This is what Jesus is saying here to the disciples. He's saying, nip this in the bud. Nip it now. Stop now. It's the first thing he tells them. Because he knows they are going down that rabbit trail. They are going there. And he's saying, stop it. Now, do you think that the disciples responded and took what he had to say and did it calm their troubled heart? It did. What do they do right after this whole situation? They go out into the garden and what do they do? They go to sleep. If they were still struggling with this whole thing, they would be going, okay, what am I going to do? How is this all going to work? No. They heard what he had to say and they went, oh, okay, all right, okay. And they go to sleep. So this particular exhortation is essential. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul says, Therefore, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Because there is a war in your mind. Every day you have a war in your mind. And you need to learn how to win the war in your mind. He tells us here, he says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The greatest weapon you have to pull down those strongholds are the promises of God. Because putting your faith in His promise is what delivers you. And is, it is a mighty weapon. It's not a carnal weapon. He says, casting down arguments. That l- word literally means dethroning arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity. The word captivity means control. It's the meaning of the Greek word. Control. Bringing every thought into control to the obedience, literally the submission of Christ. So this is what Paul says to do with your thinking. You have to learn how to control what you think. You have to choose to what you're going to think about. 
And if it's something that is exalting itself against the knowledge of God, against the promises of God, it's wrong. That's it. It's wrong. Reject it. Dethrone the ideas, the truths from your thinking. And trust in what God's word declares. Now the second thing that Jesus commands them to do is he commands them to believe in him. He says here, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now that last little phrase, believe also in me, is also in the imperative mood in the Greek, which means it is also a command. So he's commanding you to believe in him. Now, again, if he commands you to believe in him, is that possible? Yes, it is possible. He has given to every single one of us a measure of faith. And so you must choose to put your faith in him. And that is what will calm your soul. Now, faith in God, Jesus said here, is equal to faith in Jesus. So Jesus here is claiming, again, equality with God the Father. Now, Jesus has done this every single time throughout his ministry when he comes to a question of who he is and what relationship you have with him. He deals with this equality. And I've mentioned it every single time he has made these statements. Here it is again. If you want to believe in God, you need to believe in me because they are one in the same. Don't see any difference between them. But his point here is fundamentally that faith is the key to not giving in to a troubled heart. That is what keeps you from giving in, from letting your heart become troubled. Faith in him. This is an essential thing. Now faith is a choice. It's a faith. It's a choice to believe in him. Every single one of you has that choice every single day over whatever struggle, whatever problem comes into your life. You have a choice. I'm going to either trust him or I'm not going to trust him. I'm going to commit this into his hands or I'm going to work it out myself. That's your only option. There isn't anything in between. So faith is a choice. This is why Paul called faith the obedience of faith. In Romans 1.5, he says, Through him, notice, through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So faith is something that you need to, well, it's a command, so I need to obey the command. Obey the command and put your trust in Him. Now the question is, what do you put your trust in? Again, I've already stated it. It's the promises of God. When you put your faith in the promises of God, whatever promise deals with your specific circumstance, then you put your faith in Him through His promise, and that is what lifts your heart. Now, every one of you have done this at some point. I know you have. If you've had a relationship with the Lord for any length of time and you've opened the scripture when you're troubled, you begin to pray when you're troubled, you're going to come upon God's promise and it's going to take hold and you're going to take hold of it by faith. And that's how it takes hold of you and your heart. And it lifts your heart. And then you begin to walk. Now, sure, the walk might be a little unsteady. It may be a little shaky. And you may have to go back to that promise many times. But that is what sets you free. It's, it's that simple. It's no more difficult than that. This is why Jesus put an if in front of this word believe so often. It's an if. It's a choice. You know, you've heard me say it many times. The Bible is an iffy book. There's lots of ifs in it. And that 
clearly denotes that there is a choice. And it's your responsibility to make that choice. And nobody can make it for you. Notice he says in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said to them, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. That if is a big if. John 11.40, to Mary and Martha, Jesus said, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? You see, over and over again, you will find this word, if. It denotes a choice. And the choice is, the, is what you need to make. Will you choose to trust Him? Now, for the disciples... They needed to choose some very specific things and promises to trust in. They needed to trust first in the sovereignty of God. That God had all these circumstances all in his plan and in his hand. He was working all of this out for his perfect plan. They see this after the fact. I mean, Peter, in in the book of Acts, says later, God, according to his foreknowledge, brought all of this to pass. And he saw that it was all a part of the plan, that Christ would be crucified, that he would rise again, that he would fill them with the Holy Spirit, and that one day he would come back to this earth. He saw it all as as an incredible plan. That's hindsight. Looking forward, you have to just simply trust the promise. You have to trust his word. This is what he said, and this is what he will do. That's the only way you get through that. And so you either believe God's sovereign hand has all the circumstances of your life, or you don't. It's that simple. You believe it, or you don't. David, in 1 Chronicles 29 He says this at the end of his life. He clearly believed God was sovereign. He says this, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. You see, David looked back on his life and he said, Lord, this is all you. Everything that has taken place, all the blessings that you have given, they are all you. Your sovereign hand have brought this to pass. But secondly, you need to believe that all things are working together for good for those who love God and are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8.28. That is the, the place you need to go. This is where the disciples need to go. They need to say, Lord, you're working this all out. I don't know how you're working it all out, but you are working it all out for your good. That's your promise. And so, Lord, I'm going to either trust you or I'm not. That's the bottom line. That's your decision to make. And then third and last, you've got to believe that he loves you. This is really the bottom line. Because to hear that he is sovereign and that he's at work, well, but does he love me? Does he love me enough to work all these things out for good? You see, all things are not good that happened to me, but all things are going to be working together for good because I do love him and he loves me. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. There it is. That is the truth. Now you either believe his word or you do not believe his word. That he either loves this world and he loves you or you do not. Jesus is going to focus in his prayer in John 17 upon this fact. The last words that he says to them 
Go read it. It's powerful. He's saying, I love you. That's where he leaves them. It's the bottom line. So you've got to trust that he does care. So you have a decision to make. Are you gonna, what, what are you going to let your heart do? Secondly, you've got a decision to make. Are you going to trust God for his promise? And then thirdly, Jesus says here, I'm coming back to get you. I've told you I'm leaving you, but I'm coming back to get you. What an incredible hope that would give them. Notice in verses 2 and 3, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now that's music to their ears, let me tell you. Because they are, they are concerned. I'm going away where are you going? I mean, this is the next exchange they have. We'll get to this next week. I don't know the way. What, what way? Where are you going? And he's going to explain to them the way. But it's a simple thing. He's just telling them here, look, I'm coming back for you. And so Christ's point here is don't be troubled because you're ultimately going to heaven. You're going and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to usher you in to that into that kingdom. And he says, More, moreover, I have prepared a place for you. Now this word mansion here in verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. Uh, most of your center references or your, in your Bible say dwelling places. And that is the correct and better translation. I mean, many times people think, oh, he's building a cathedral for me up in heaven somewhere you know, with just, you know, big columns and, you know, great swimming pool out back and so on. And that is not what he's talking about. It has nothing to do with what he's talking about. This is a dwelling place. I believe it's speaking about your new body, the physical body that you have right now when you die is going to turn into dust. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says there, if this earthly tabernacle does, it dissolves, he said, I have a building of God eternal in the heavens or a dwelling place that's eternal in the heavens. And that dwelling place is that new body. And so that'll be better than any, you know, mansion, let me tell you. You, you get a new body, especially the older you get, the more you long for a new body. And so, I'm looking for a new body. And that is going to be a joy. Because then, serving Him will be without difficulty in any way, any shape, any form. So, He's preparing a place for you. So, why is this so important? Well, it really is getting their eyes off of the temporal and getting their eyes on to the eternal. Now, that is what troubles me most of all. It's just looking around in this world and the troubles that I have in this world or the physical body that I have in this world. That's what troubles me and gives me the most trouble. But what he's saying is you need to catch your eyes onto the spiritual, this, the eternal. You know, my wife always says to me when she sees I'm troubled, she says this little phrase, this little saying. She says, uh, this is a small thing in the course of eternity. Have you ever heard her say that? And it's, it's a great saying because it does that instantly, just like that. You go, yep. This is a small thing in the course of eternity. I mean, if you compare yourself with Christians in other parts of the world today, you'll see what a small thing your troubles are. Think about maybe a believer who is in Iran today, imprisoned 
or maybe in the Sudan, imprisoned because of their faith. You're hungry, you, you get regularly beaten, you are cold. You know, many of you knew Saeed, who was in the Iranian prison. They put him right next to a window that was broken in the dead of winter and a little thin blanket to hold on. And that's, that's where you sleep every night. I'm telling you, I, I, when I read that, I just thought to myself, I have nothing to complain about. My trials, my struggles are minor. They are a small thing compared to that. But his trials, even then, are a small thing compared to eternity. Or you could be a Christian woman today in Nigeria or in Syria and you've been taken captive to be someone, some sheikh's or some warlord's sex slave. There are women today in that circumstance right now. I'm telling you, my struggles are really small compared to that. So it's, it really is getting your eyes on the eternal. What gets those people through their struggle? It's the same thing that gets you through your struggle. It's focusing on the eternal. This is how Paul described it in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So you can't look at just, I mean, really, it's, it's all temporary. Everybody in this room, your body is temporary. It's just a temporary dwelling place. It's a tent, the, the Bible says. And one day you're going to move out of this tent. And you're going to leave all your stuff for someone else to decide what they're going to do with it all. And that's it. And you're going to be in the presence of God or you will be apart from the presence of God. That's your only option. So you have to make that decision. Where do you want to spend your eternity? So keep your eyes fixed on on the goal. That's the, that's the point. That is what gives a person hope. When you realize that you're going to be with him and you're going to see him as he is and you're going to be like him when you see him, that gives tremendous hope. John said it this way in 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. He says, Beloved, now are we children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, notice, this is the hope, purifies himself just as he is pure. So if you want to know what motivates someone to holiness, what motivates someone to be obedient to God, to be obedient to the faith, It's this hope. If you want that motivation inside that drives you forward, this is it right here. If you know where you're going and you know one day you're going to see him face to face, that's what Jesus is telling him here. I am coming again. And he is coming again at your death or at the rapture, one of the two. And he is going to receive you unto himself. And that is the joy, that is the hope you should be looking for. And that should purify your heart and motivate you to pursue Him, to follow Him, to be a light for Him. That's your motivation. And there is no higher motivation than that. It is the supreme motivation. And so I pray that today you would stop and say, okay, I'm going to meet him face to face. But will you be received by him? That's the question. Will you be 
allowed into the kingdom? Will He usher you in to His kingdom? That's only something that you and, and He know. Because I don't know anybody's heart here. But the question is, are you sure? Are you sure you will be received? If you're not sure, you need to respond to Christ. You need to respond to His outstretched hand. You need to confess Him as Lord of your life and receive His forgiveness. You can do that just simply by prayer, by asking Him to come in and take over your life. And I would encourage you, if you're here this morning and you're saying, I, I'm not sure. Come down here forward after the service. There'd be some men and women down here. They'd love to pray with you. They would love to lead you to Him. It's your decision. It's your choice. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we thank You so much that, Lord, You, you want our hearts to be untroubled. You want our hearts to be full of joy. And Lord, that is your message to these, your own. These disciples need to hear these words. And, and we as your disciples need to hear these words. We need your comfort. We need that encouragement. We need that assurance and hope. Lord, we, we pour out our hearts to you this morning. We ask that you would come and take over. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Live in us, Lord, and help us to make that choice, that decision every day to not let our hearts be troubled. Help us not go down that road. Help us to trust your promise. Lord, we do this morning. We trust your promise. You're big enough, Lord. You can handle us and everything in our lives. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We commit our loved ones to you, Lord, especially those that do not know you or those that are struggling in their faith towards you. Lord, we commit them into your hands, Lord. You are big enough. You can send your people. You can send your spirit. And, Lord, we, we trust you to do that. Help us, Lord, to be a light and be used by you when you send us to someone that you want to speak to. Lord, we trust that you'll do that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.